So after I made the wideband helical cone antenna, a lot of people asked if uh, this would be prone to uh, interference from other frequencies because it's such a wideband antenna and that is always a uh, downside from a wideband antenna. Now, I don't think it would really cause that much of a problem unless you were trying to force the two separate frequencies through this at once, say 2.4 gigahertz and 5.8 gigahertz. But um, what I've done, I've come up with uh, one that's uh, more designed more for 5.8 gigahertz. So its center frequency is bang on around that mark and not so wideband like this one is. Now, a couple of other changes I've done because I want to try and reduce its uh, wideband characteristic is the uh, wire that I used in this one is a little bit too thick to use in the 5.8 gigahertz. So this is the wire that I uh, used in that uh, antenna and it's two millimeter uh, thick galvanized steel garden wire. So I want to use something a little bit uh, thinner. Now normally when you want to use something thinner you also have to take into consideration that uh, it's not as strong and it's easier to actually knock it out of shape. This is some uh, copper wire, it's uh, 1.6 millimeters thick and uh, although it's 1.6 millimeters it's still quite soft and pliable so I don't think it would take much abuse at all. So I've decided to go with some brass wire. This brass wire is also 1.6 millimeters thick but uh, it holds its shape a lot better it's more springy and uh, if you did uh, bend it it does tend to spring back into its original state so it's a lot stronger so that's the wire that i'm going to use in this build now for the bat reflector i'm using uh, a single sided pcb board again but this time i've cut it out with a uh, circular saw and uh, circular saw is 35 millimeters but by the time it cuts this out this is actually 34 millimeters so this is what i'm going to use for the uh, back reflector on this again this is something you can experiment with and you could even have a uh, square reflector if you didn't want to uh, cut it out into a circle and that would work just fine as well and for the center strengthening rod, instead of using a pen this time, I've got hold of this uh, six millimeter hardwood dowling. So that's what I'm actually going to use for the strengthening rod in the center here. Now the length of this uh, brass rod is 300 millimeters and that's just enough to actually make one of these uh, antennas for 5.8 gigahertz. There's probably about uh, 60 millimeters left over at the end. Now I'm going to be using this uh, jig tool that I made in a previous video to this but uh, this time instead of using all of the uh, cone here I'm going to be stopping at this mark here. I've put a little blue piece of tape where I actually need to stop. Now the reason I'm stopping here is because this turn here has a uh, circumference of just over 52 millimeters. Now you want the largest turn on uh, this antenna to be uh, round about the uh, full wavelength of the frequency you're trying to get it centered on. So one full wavelength at 5.8 gigahertz is around that 52 millimeter range. So hopefully this antenna will be more tuned to 5.8 gigahertz. So you won't get that interference from uh, anything around 2.4 gigahertz. So I'm starting off in the same way. I've got it locked in the top through that eyelet there. And uh, this brass wire isn't so much stronger than steel, but it doesn't actually like to bend it and stay there. It's extremely springy. So I'm having to apply a lot more force to actually bring it round into those grooves. And when I actually get it down at the bottom where I'm going to stop, I'm going to give it a few pulls with some pliers to really tighten it in there and lock it to where I actually want those coils. So as you can see, if I let off the pressure, it does spring out of its uh, little grooves there. And originally when I designed this, I did have a uh, two millimeter leadway because most uh, metals actually spring out a little bit more, but uh, brass is even worse. So I'm going to use the pliers and apply a little bit more force to get it to stay in that position. And because I've got this tool, it's a lot easier to apply force.
So I have had to uh, apply quite a lot of pressure in this direction using the pliers but uh, I'm actually happy how this is uh, lying now. The uh, spaces uh, between the coils are all nice and even but uh, as you can see it has uh, popped out a uh, little bit on the uh, bottom coils here but it's still within that uh, two millimeter tolerance so I'm quite happy with that. So I've got the coils off the jig. I'm just going to trim this small amount off the top there and I'm also going to leave myself uh, quite a longish piece here that I'm going to bend in on itself. Basically the method is exactly the same as the uh, previous video. So I'm going to bend that in at a right angle to actually come in on itself so we can solder our coax to that and actually connect to the antenna itself but uh, as you can see it's uh, holding its shape really well. It is strong stuff brass. It's just uh, actually difficult to actually bend without it actually springing back. So now I've got the coil to this stage. I'm going to just leave that to one side for the moment and I'm going to work on the uh, reflector itself. Now to actually connect to this antenna I'm using some semi-rigid coax. It just gives you a little bit more flexibility to bend it in whatever position you actually want and uh, as you see here I've uh, prepared it. I've left quite a long piece of the signal wire here that uh, I've exposed and a small amount of the dielectric so that little piece of dielectric just comes up to about level with the uh, PCB board there and I've flared out some of the outer braid here because what I'm going to actually do is solder that on to the uh, back reflector and then probably add a little bit of uh, epoxy putty or something like that just to give it some more strength. So I've flown some solder around the hole on that PCB board there and now what I'm going to do I'm going to position the coax in the middle and then I'm going to solder each one of these legs in place and then fill the rest in with some solder as well. So the best way to actually do this is just tack the legs in place first. Then when you've got one tacked in you can just go around and tack all the others and then you can flow some solder all the way around there. So the coax is soldered onto the reflector now and it is on there kind of strong as it is but I do like to actually get in there with a the Dremel clean it up a little bit and put some epoxy putty around here just to give it some extra strength. So now that we've got the coax on the reflector prepared I'm going to finish off preparing the coils now. Now it does need a uh, ballon to get the impedance matching down to uh, 50 ohms just like its bigger brother does. So I've got a piece of uh, metal here, just some tin that I've uh, salvaged and uh, I've marked off a little triangle here, it's 10 millimeters along its longest part there and uh, five millimeters in there and this is going to actually go here so I'm going to cut this out and I'm going to solder it onto this part here just like I did with its uh, bigger brother. Now as far as brass is concerned I haven't had any trouble actually soldering this brass but you do have to prepare it just like you would any soldering job so I've got a little bit of emery paper and roughed it up a little bit just cleaned it up so uh, I'm going to flow some solder on here now and I'm actually going to cut this out and flow some solder on the edges of this and then hopefully I can just get my tweezers hold it in place a little bit of heat and uh, it should do the job just fine. So I'm holding it in position there just a small amount of solder on my tip just to transfer that heat onto the metal there. So I've got that side soldered on so a little bit of heat on this side should finish the job off. And here's a close up of what it actually looks like. If you've got a little bit of excess solder on, on the sides here it's uh, a lot easier to actually get in with a Dremel if you need to tidy it up but that one looks okay. So I've trimmed back the centre connector of the coax because I'm going to solder the coil onto that now and I've also bent it over as you can see here and uh, what I'm actually going to do is feed the coil under there and solder those two together and that should give me a really strong solder joint and what I'll do as well is add a little bit of epoxy afterwards underneath here and then uh, a little bit of epoxy on the top of there just to protect it 
and that should uh, give us a nice strong joint and as well as the uh, rod that goes up through the middle it'll be a really strong antenna. Now I've got a piece of the dowel in here I've measured off 60 millimeters and I've also cut a notch in the bottom there just so it'll fit over the top of that solder joint and what I'll do I'll epoxy this in place at the bottom there and a little bit of epoxy and some heat shrink tubing over the top here as well. So the epoxy is set at the base there and I've just put a little bit of epoxy there on that top coil and uh, what I'm going to do now is before the epoxy sets properly I'm going to put the little bit of heat shrink tubing over the top there and then that will give me a really strong joint at the top as well and hold it all nice and vertical. So I've set up a small test here, I've got the cone helical antenna up against the uh, double helical antenna that I built some time ago. I'm using uh, two identical Alpha Wi-Fi cards, both using 5 GHz Wi-Fi, so slightly off centre frequency. But I'm hoping this test will uh, actually show one of the uh, major benefits of using a cone helical over a more traditional helical antenna. So I'm going to give them both a scan. So we'll let them settle down a bit. So now that they've actually settled down and uh, you look at the access points that both antennas have picked up. On the left there you've got the cone helical antenna. It's picked up many more access points than the more traditional helical antenna. But uh, if you look at some of the access points that both antennas have picked up, the signal strength is very similar. But uh, the cone antenna has a much wider beam width so it's uh, picking up more access points to the side where the helical antenna is not actually seeing those because it's uh, much narrower but again they're both about the same kind of power over distance so that's one of the biggest benefits from a uh, cone helical antenna is it has a much wider beam width than a more traditional helical antenna. So the cone helical then is a uh, nice little antenna to uh, have in your kit and uh, its uh, DBI is probably about the same as a helical of this size, probably about uh, 8 to 9 DBI for the number of turns on this one but uh, as you saw in that test with its wideband properties it's uh, a little bit more forgiving if you haven't got it pointed directly at your quadcopter. So now that I've actually got the jig and I'm quite happy how that's uh, actually working I uh, am looking at putting a quantity of these in my shop very soon so uh, keep an eye out for that but again if you actually want to have a go at making one of these yourself then uh, by all means do that and uh, let us know how you actually got on how you actually uh, find it out there in the real world with a uh, quadcopter FPV setup. So again I uh, hope you enjoyed this video and you found it interesting and informative and if you did please give it a uh, thumbs up any uh, comments or questions below and uh, hopefully you'll join me on the next one.